Without further ado, let me pass it over to James, who has initially or earlier been introduced. James is going to moderate a session about the journey to industrialized construction. So, James, over to you. Thank you, Roberto. So what, we're going, what we have prepared here is a group of uh, experts that are going to talk about their specific uh, journey and their role that they play in the journey to industrialized construction. But uh, before I start, I might have to do some push-up to match Amy's intensity and uh, energy level. So, so give me, give, might have to do that a little bit. So how does industrialization fit within the modern construction discussion that we've been having today? And Todd actually presented this earlier. So modern construction has three pillars, which is the automation and industrialization and digitalization. And we're proposing that the framework underneath it is operation science that we, a lot of the, uh, the speakers actually have touched on today. So one of the things that people started to talk about is why we need to actually modernize construction. And what is the and as you can see from the news articles everywhere, that there is no shortage of people diving into it. So one, someone actually has, the construction users round table has predicted that the modular market is to grow to a $215 billion market by 2025. That's in four years, well, almost three years now, okay? At the same time, there are large investments being made into the industry so Berkshire Hathaway is already backing up a startup to partner with architecture of modularizing hotels and apartment buildings. However, the, the road to success doesn't seem to be without its own challenges. As you might very well know, a company that had invested tremendous amount of money has recently filed for bankruptcy. And as you can probably say, this is not due to lack of funding. Okay. So one of the things that we need to figure out is what is, what do we need to do to make sure our journey is successful to achieving the industrial construction and modernized construction. Okay. So one of the things that we keep hearing of what industrialized construction is, is the adoption of manufacturing techniques or approaches to construction. So what does it mean to adopt manufacturing or purchase construction? What does that mean? And it seems like based on the organizations that we're talking to, it has many different meanings. Some say it's moving work offsite into factory environment. Some say it's standardizing products to minimize design duration. Some say it's adopting supply led design. Some saying it's design one and make or build many. Some are saying it's actually change from an engineer to order to made to stock or made to order. And some are saying chunking product into modules. I'm sure there are many other alter different alternatives or perspectives that's out there. Okay. However, one of the critical questions that people seem to be asking when they're thinking about this is this, how do we do what and where? If we're gonna move the work from the site, on site to off site, what does that look like? Are we going to move the, the welders and the, and the laborers actually into equipment, into the fabrication shop? And is it going to be craft manufacturing? Are we going to invest, start investing in large robots to go do that? And if we're going to start having, uh, doing fabrication or assembly off site, what are we buying versus what I'm making? How do we make that? right trade-off decisions, okay? So the way the people seem to be going about this journey is as follows. And Todd actually, again, uh, hinted on this a little bit earlier, is that there is the uh, conventional design and procure and build method that everyone's very familiar with. And in order to get to the next step, it seems like there's a lot of emphasis and digitalization and automation of the current processes. So number one things that, a lot, that we've seen is you know, putting in systems to automate the shop drawing processes, automate the, the facility, facilitate the document exchange to reduce uh, latency in document exchange and so forth. Okay? 
And the automation could be a workflow automation through using systems or automation buying robot or investing in robotics. So we've seen companies that invest in ro robots and as we talked about before, they may be producing something faster that they, they may not need. However, that seems to be a simple next step that a lot of people are taking. As that's actually happening, people are starting to say, okay, we're going to move the work off site. And that could be just a fabrication as well as that could also be actually assembly. One of the things that people are finding out a little bit later is when that's occurring is the associated cost of additional handling, holding, and cash tied up. But that seems to be something that there are a lot of people are going through. As it moves more into manufacturing opportunity, which is fabrication and offsite assembly, people are starting to divest into or invest into standardization and productization and DFMA that Amy also talked about. Okay? Once the product is being designed and, and you could say standardized and productized, then the question comes, okay, we need to produce hundreds of these or thousands of these. We're going from engineer to order to made stock, which means we need to carry an inventory of these. How do we make this? And from an owner's perspective, it's where is the supply chain that can make this? So what's been happening is that the concept of how do we go make this comes a little bit later than what we're going to make. And then once that's addressed, then you're getting into the more of a industrialized construction view. Now, beyond that, not sure what's, what the road, further roadmap holds, holds for many of the companies that are on this journey, but that seems to be the, uh, the, the journey that they're taking. And if you overlay the five levers that Todd talks about, talked about this morning, it seems to be something like this. There's a lot of emphasis in what we're making, which is the product design. And then it starts to go, go a little bit actually into the process design element. And then once those two are pretty much well-defined, then comes the later, which is the capacity inventory and variability. Again, going back to the presentation before. And then if there isn't the cap capacity or the production system to support the product design and design, what ends up happening is going into a iteration to come back to now change the product design and then in the back and forth. Okay. So what we're going to talk about later on in this uh, session is maybe there is an alternative map that allows to get that allows us to achieve the value that we're looking for a little bit faster. But, but before we get there, what we're going to do is invite experts to talk about some of these extra elements that they're implementing and that what they've been experiencing in their own organizations. Okay. With that, I'm going to be handing off to Bridget Prue to talk about her experience at Autodesk. Bridget, can you turn on your audio? And, uh... I am on audio, but I have, oh, I can start my video now. Perfect. We All see right. you. All right. So I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction. Uh, by Bridget. Bridget is a principal business consultant in industrialized construction at Autodesk. She is an architect by training with a specialty in industrialized construction and is tackling client strategy, engagement, and implementation of industrialized methods of construction across a project life cycle. Bridget joins Autodesk from a general contractor kitchen construction contractors where she spent six years working across disciplines, including designer, trade partner, manufacturer, and general contract to, to leverage BIM and industrialized method of construction. She received a bachelor's in architecture and was hired by Kitchell to help uh, define and implement her, their uh, industrialized construction initiative and challenge industry norms. Bridget, thank you. And I'm gonna stop sharing so that you can share your screen. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I am basically going to be kind of adding on to some of the topics that Amy was talking about and specifically what I am working at alongside Amy and all of our other consultants within Autodesk in order to help our clients along this transformation framework for industrialized construction. So with that, let's jump into this. Hold on, let me just make sure that I have. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. We, we okay. See. All 
All right. Sorry, one second. I have to stop sharing because it is being a little buggy all of a sudden. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, we see your okay. screen again. So, one of the things that we're doing, like you had mentioned, is we're trying to rethink how and what the information that is flowing across the phases of the building um, life cycle are what is being influenced through manufacturing informed design. So with that, we have actually kind of refined what the roles are doing within these phases. So as you can see here, we have operate, define products, inform design, make and assemble. As operators or owners, you are articulating the end user and operational requirements and desires. In the defined products, you are the makers and you are enabling dynamic product definition for manufactured assemblies in the built environment. As informed designers, you are setting the detailed parameters of assemblies in their aggregate as the building requires both products and bespoke elements. As makers, you are manufacturers or builders manufacturing the parts to be assembled using advanced manufacturing processes, technology and techniques. And as assemblers, you are system integrators. You are efficient and accelerated in integration and commissioning of manufactured assemblies within situ construction. So the reason we kind of redefine some of these things is really just to level set that within this convergence, we are seeing clients coming from the manufacturing side that want to not only make, but also assemble. We're seeing owners who want to own that entire process from operate through to assemble. Also owners who want a playbook to scale and recycle and reuse these processes and data. Manufacturers who want to manufacture and integrate, I already mentioned that one. Sim similarly, general contractors that are trying to become more like manufacturers and use those methodologies so that they can be more efficient in their businesses. And additionally, subcontractors that are defining these products that are manufacturing and also assembling. So these are just kind of the, the new roles that we are seeing that our clients are fitting within, within different use cases. Autodesk hoping to help leverage those different use cases in their individual business journeys through this transformation framework. So the transformation framework is really, we are meeting our clients where they are at within this maturity journey of industrialized construction. And we are helping them lay out that, those capabilities that they need at each step to get them to that next step for that future business vision or the future state of industrialized construction, which as you can see at the top is this digital and physical reuse for all, for sustainability, for, as Amy had mentioned, not, re, not designing more than once. So that's where you really get your value of, you know, your business um, efficiencies. And so that's what we're working towards. So really briefly, not to go over this again, but foundationally, we are partnering with you to assess the maturity of the current IC readiness, as far as data, tools, technology, culture, and really just setting that foundation so that you can actually adopt these next steps efficiently and sustainably rather than kind of beating down the wrong path so next would be productization and ensuring that what is your product and the processes and workflows and the technology that is associated to those workflows. And we help define that and work with you to find where those gaps are and help leverage those through the digitization. So how are these workflows automated? How can we eliminate some of these processes that are redundant? How are we leveraging tools to help connect the workflows? across industries and partners. Next would be the connection, how many of these workflows are being moved to the cloud to be shared with the stakeholders and how can we as Autodesk help connect this um, beyond just the stakeholders, which would then put us into optimization. Now that you are connected through the cloud, we can help leverage other opportunities with the data such as generative design, digital twins and true industrialized construction, finally getting you to that point of circularity. So the things that we are focusing on are enabling that business transformation by helping our customers create that business value and applying the manufacturing techniques, technology, and processes. We are connecting platform workflows. 
implementing and capturing these workflows across the Autodesk platform and forge services, understanding any enablers and constraints. And finally, expanding the platform capabilities, partnering with customers on changing business processes to enhance capabilities using forge ecosystem and consulting partners. So really quickly, I just wanted to show a little clip in here of an example of essentially the consulting services that we are bringing from the manufacturing side, from the solution architecture side, from the architecture, engineering, construction, in the integrated factory modeling space of how we are leveraging all these different processes in order to really enable that next step or that future state of manufacturing. Bridget, the audio is not coming across from the mm. video. Well, then, you know what? That might have to be skipped. I apologize for that. Essentially, what we are talking about is connected work. Oops. One second. Can you see my, see my screen? Yes, we see okay. your screen. So what we're really talking about, and in summary of what that video was supposed to be showing, is we're talking about these connected workflows. From, de, from make that is informing, helping inform design, which is helping inform the defined products. We are taking these tools and not necessarily the specific tools under the Autodesk cloud, but the, the roles of those tools and taking the data that, and defining those constraints, leveraging it through Forge so that you have that single data um, source and that is what is really gonna be connecting the engineering design and make workflows. So we are partnering to help define those requirements and constraints, connect that data and provide that interoperability of those tools utilizing the platform. Another example is that we are helping leverage the appropriate levels of detail of that data to be generated and consumed between the product engineers, designers and makers. So once you get digitized and connected, we are leveraging our extensive manufacturing experience and portfolio to support the advanced and emerging manufacturing processes such as generative design, additive manufacturing, factory simulation and analysis, tooling and robotics at scale, just as some of the examples. And what some of those also look like would be as shown. But really, what the kind of the moral of our story, I apologize for the graphic on this because I was searching for it last minute, but I think it's a really important slide to show where the industry convergence is happening. And the biggest problem of everyone is understanding where to really start. And that is where at Autodesk Consulting, that transformation framework applies to the different use cases of our clients and their individual journeys within that maturity matrix where we can help Everyone becomes system integrators, understand the productization and become product makers. But at the end of the day, the Autodesk is really just providing the platform for that connection of all of that content. And with that, I will hand it over to questions, comments. Okay, well, thank you, Richard. I think what we're going to do is because this is all integrated topic that we're going to be discussing, what we'd like to do is hand over to the next speaker to hold the, as we talk about time buffer at the end of the session, then we can bring in the questions that everybody can chime in. Okay. All right. So with that, what we're going to do is now hand off to Keith McCowan from BP. Let me actually introduce him. Keith is the central subsea unit leader for uh, BP, responsible for the delivery, installation, and life of field service for all of BP's subsea production system globally. Prior to his current role, Keith has held numerous major capital project leadership positions, predominantly in the North Sea, Egypt, and Angola. Keith is a fellow of IMACI and is a graduate 
from the University of Edinburgh with an honors degree in electrical, electrical and mechanical engineering. Okay. Keith, yep. over Thanks, to you. James. All right, let me. Yep, we see your screen. Very good. Thanks. Uh, yeah, look, I appreciate the invite to, to join you today. Um, it's a, a topic that's, you know, I've been working on for a while, but, you know, certainly this year it seems to have taken a bit more of a, a, a turbo boost for me. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> so starting um, with the energy transition. I think the first bit is the energy transition is real. You know, there's a lot of government societal pressure. You know, you don't have to go um, too long in the news before you're seeing something about it, whether it's COP26, ESG agenda, uh, or global warming. But, you know, the I guess the companies like BP are actually responding to that. You know, Bernard came out with a new strategy when he uh, took over as CEO in February 2020 about you know the what you know what's bp going to do with regards to the the energy transition so from uh moving from an ioc to an iec part of that is going to be you know spending 10 times the amount on uh, renewable energy uh by 2030 than we did in 2019 but on top of that we're going to be reducing daily production by 40 percent by 2030 and that's to try and aim towards the you know the net zero uh, carbon ambition by 2050. On top of you know the increased spend in renewables, we've also you know uh, we've reduced the capital frame that we have available for us. So ultimately, that means there's less money for uh, oil and gas projects inside of the the new company. <coughs> what does that mean for subsea? So I've been looking at that with less less money available for oil and gas it means the the economic hurdles to get oil you know subsea projects approved has gone up it's got harder and ultimately that means that if we keep doing what we're doing or what we've always done it just means that subsea is going to look very unattractive it's high risk you know it takes you know it takes ages to actually go from a you know a discovery through into first oil first gas and when you're competing with, you know, drilling for gas in the desert, the Permian Basin, you know, like I said, if we keep doing subsidy the way we're doing it, then, you know, it's just not going to be a, an attractive proposition. So I've been developing up the, the, the subsidy vision for BP, you know, and uh, I think three areas that I felt were really important for us was, you know, a 20% uh, reduction in total cost of ownership. You know, and that's trying to really start looking at, um, you know, how higher systems and subsea systems performing across their full life cycle, rather than what's cheapest to buy up front, which is kind of the way we've always been doing it. So really looking to boost, you know, subsea production system reliability above 98%, you know, so that we're getting more out of the assets that we have available. That also then helps reduce the number of interventions we're doing through time, which then helps with you know, the low carbon ambition that, that the company's laid out. Big challenge about that, you know, and driving reliability and quality of the systems up is ultimately about the uh, contracting and how uh, we work with our suppliers. When you're looking at return on investment, like I said, it takes ages for subsidy projects to get uh, designed, delivered and brought online. You know, I really want to look at the, you know, taking 50% out of the defined execute of subsidy projects. So, you know, we're not investing heavy amounts of money for that long before we start seeing return on investment. And all of that's, you know, going to be looking about, you know, productization, and, you know, the, the delivery of speed. And then forecast and accuracy is you know, hugely important because of the amount of money we're spending. If we can get the forecast and accuracy correct on, you know, not only like the overall cost and what we're going to spend between uh, plan and actual, but the phasing that's going through that, that means that, you know, we shouldn't be tying up money that we don't need to be, which then actually means that there's more money for other projects to get invested uh, into. So what's the initiative that we need to, you know, that's going to help unlock the vision? Uh, so productization, so moving from engineer to order to um, configure to order, really getting into supplier-led design. Uh, and, and truly embracing supplier-led design and making sure that there's a common understanding of what it means. And then 
like I say, looking at commercial, commercial models and really trying to align the suppliers, the contractors, you know, so that their business goals align with our business goals. We look at productization. So at the minute, subsidy projects are pretty much done at the top line. Uh, it's very project specific. It's very much operator standards that, you know, we've built up over time. And that leads to, you know, fully customized subsidy products and uh, production systems. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. And, you know, it's a real problem for the suppliers as well about, you know, having to continue to change tooling, change the what they're manufacturing, rather than actually setting their, their factories up for, you know, more efficient delivery of better quality product. Moving down into configured to order. So we've really been looking at, uh, at this for probably over 10 years now, and we've been making steps towards it. The first step was to actually take you know, take subsidy projects and subsidy uh, equipment design away from projects. We set up a, a centralized group of experts to, you know, design and deliver the, the subsidy hardware. Part of that journey was obviously, you know, trying to wrap our arms at what we were doing. But in the last couple of years, we've really got into this configured to order. So standard product catalogs, you know, really kind of looking at can we just, you know, design it once and then just use it over and over again uh, in many different applications? We're working heavily with, you know, main strategic suppliers that we have. Uh, they're all in favor of it. They've all developed up, uh, you know, their own kind of electronic platform uh, where, you know, we do the pre-engineering and agreement with them up front. That then ends up in their catalog. And then when we want to start looking at new project concepts, we work with them on in you know using the catalogs to help build you know it's like lego blocks about what we want to you know what we want to uh, use in order to actually build up uh, new concepts it's been pretty successful so far <coughs> there's a long way to go uh, but you know the early results are you know certainly helping you know deliver the the vision that I, i've set out earlier supplier-led solutions i think it's a term that's uh, grossly misused and misunderstood to be honest you know, I guess some people interpret supplier-led solutions as, you know, whatever the supplier wants to give us, it's fine. Um, it's not the case, right? You know, for, for us, it's really about looking at um, risk. Right? What's the risk that we're actually trying to look at? Well, we've accepted that, you know, the, the engineering standards that we've built up over time through experience, you know, are, are pretty much gold-plated. Um, the suppliers, on the other hand, are actually looking at, you know, industry specs and what they can do with the industry specs and their own internal experience. And I think supplier-led solutions is really about that middle part where I've said uh, standard product services catalog, where we've actually gone and looked at and challenged our requirements versus the, you know, what the suppliers are working with. Can we accept the risk or can we not? And where we can't, then, you know, we have that uh, discussion debate with the suppliers and actually then come up with something which is mutually agreeable, both with them and us. You know, potentially it could be actually resulting in a, you know, a change to industry code. But the first step is about getting that alignment with us. <coughs> so it's not a blank, you know, we, we'll take anything, but very much, you know, risk-based decisions, you know, mutually agreed between ourselves and the supply chain. Aligning incentives. So... Sounds really simple when you say it out loud, contractor wins and BP wins. Um, I think if it was that easy, it would have been done decades ago. But, you know, fundamentally, you know, the, the whole industry has been built on, you know, supplier, you know, builds this equipment, we install it, it breaks, they come out and fix it, we pay the money, right? And, you know, the cycle just kind of continues for the next 20, 20 odd years. When you look at uh, contractor wins, BP wins, so the full alignment of you know the the supplier and BP's goals, you know that really means we need to start looking at commercial models and contracts and actually how we work together. So you know what what's going to enable the, you know both BP and the the supplier to get aligned. You know I looked at this a while ago with regards to like a contract service agreement, so similar to an airline engine, can I apply that into subsea? And, you know, I kind of went round and round in circles with this one. And ultimately the epiphany I had was subsea is not an airplane engine. Uh, it's more akin to satellite, 
you know, it costs you a fortune to build it, it costs a fortune to put it where it is, and it costs even more of a fortune to go and fix it if it breaks. So, you know, setting up an agreement where you're actively trying to, you know, actively trying to maintain equipment subsea isn't a good idea. So, you know, it's going to then be about pay for performance. You know, how do we make sure that what goes on the seabed actually continues to work? You know, the suppliers, you know, a large part of their business is their aftermarket um, services part of, the, you know, of their business. So they're not going to willingly <clears throat> give that up. So, you know, we need to look at remuneration and actually, you know, how do they get paid for every day their equipment works, right? And actually, you know, therefore, you know, when their equipment's working, we're earning money, therefore they should be earning money. When it stops, you know, stops working, we stop earning money, money and so do they. Therefore, the reaction time to, to fix it, you know, should improve. And actually, there should be a, a mutual benefit about driving higher quality and more reliable equipment through this you know, through uh, some seat. So when I, uh, when I did a, a presentation at the ECC forum, you know, I worked with, you know, both SPS and Chevron, and we came up with this diagram about modern production or intelligent project production. What we figured out was, you know, the, the work I've been doing on productization is very much that left-hand vertical leg, you know, about, the, the products and the, the, the standards I've been working on. And Chevron and very much been working in the intelligent uh, production platform. We thought, you know, a good idea would be to actually bring the two together. And, you know, actually that should be what a, a subsidy project should look like or a project should look like. The more I listened to that, the more I was intrigued about it, you know, following the forum, I've then kicked off, you know, a study with SPS about, how do I actually go and do this for sub C? So how do I get the, the process map and the plans? Because if we're not going to be drilling uh, in new areas, we shouldn't be building big new uh, projects. And it's all going to be about fast paced time max into you know, big existing homes that we have. So it should be highly repeatable you know, and highly predictable. And I felt that was really important to you know, get after. So for me, that was you know, looking at integrated intelligence, so subsidiary imagined productization, intelligent products that, you know, we can build with the, the standard processing, the machine learning that goes on there, and then actually linking that all together. And that's going to involve, you know, a lot of work with the suppliers, you know, because I, I, they own the designs, they own the products, but, you know, we own all the operational data and then, you know, that should influence the design but it's about, you know, having that flow of that and that learning going back around so that, you know, the catalogs update as we need them, you know, uh, as we're starting to see things, the costs, the schedules that are being predicted, you know, up front, you know, are believable. And to be honest, the, the, the first project that we used the, the productization on, I got asked numerous times about, was that real? Right, because they'd never seen a project that we could actually execute in that speed. That's because it taken all the engineering and moved it off the project. So looking at the you know the progress we've had to date, I would say certainly say it's been a journey for us. You know, even in the the few weeks that we've we've been doing this, um, we've started developing up the map. We just picked a, a, a topside integrated control system because we felt there was lots of stakeholders and players in this. You know, the, this map probably took us about three weeks to get done. You know, in the last couple of weeks, it, it's expanded greatly. But it's starting to, you know, really kind of show us that, one, our processes are hugely complicated and inefficient. Two, we didn't understand what our processes were. You know, so actually that then impacts the, the reliability and predictability of the projects we're trying to do. I think, you know, if we keep going with this and we keep, you know, really kind of asking and testing every box, I think what we'll end up with is, you know, a complicated picture that needs radical simplification. You know, it was only the, the start of the week that we'd actually fully mapped out the, the document control process. And, you know, the, the conclusion from that was our engineers spend twice as much time pushing paper around through a document control process as actually understanding and managing risk in the project. Now, for me, that's completely the wrong way around. So, you know, we're going to be looking about, you know, what, what can we do to make sure the engineers are, are looking at the right work rather than, you know, trying to manage a 
guess, an inefficient and complicated process that shouldn't exist. I think at that point, I'll leave it there, James. Thank you, Keith. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting journey that you're taking, and it's a huge responsibility to take an organization as large as BP and its supply network and trying to introduce a, a new way to do things. It's, it's a, also, you know, also very interesting that you talk about supplier led and a lot of uh, there's misunderstanding around it. And it seems like it's very in line with what we're going to later be talking about is suppliers production system or capability as a starting point, because there's no reason to set a bunch of standards that no one can go build. Right. Yep. And then also to actually talk about, you had three levels, which is uh, an operator standard, contractor standard, and industry and, and standards. And I think that this morning, someone also talked about um, standardizing non-customer facing part. But when you look at it from that perspective, everyone is a customer of someone else. Yeah. Right? So, so, the, so the, the two coming together is, is pretty interesting. So we can talk a little bit more about that later when the other speakers talk, and then we can come together for some questions and answers. But thank All you right. very much for your thank you. presentation. Yeah. Okay, next, we are going to have Jan give us his perspective and his learnings about actually seeing industrialized construction in practice. So one of the things that's going to be interesting for us to take a look at is when we're starting to move work off site, it creates additional complexities on how do we now start synchronizing what we're making and delivering to what we're installing. Again, if that's not done correctly, there could be a huge amount of cash tied up in that, that uh, queue in between or stock in between resulting in detrimental effect for many companies. So Jan, please take it away. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Now I just need to make sure you all are seeing the right screen. And, and by the way, I'm skipping uh, introducing Jan because he was introduced earlier this morning, so. Thanks, uh, James. <laughs> so this is going to be a, a bit of a different presentation than prior to. It's really around the practicalities of when we choose to pursue industrialization and the realities of when it hits site. I just wanted to share some lessons learned that we observed from a major uh, chemical plant construction that we are supporting. I thought that might be interesting for you to at least see. Okay, so let me take, take you through. I realize this is a bit of a worry, but this contains the full story that I'm going to tell. Okay, so basically we supported a large chemical plant in the EMEA region, which was being constructed on EM's EPCM basis. The civil Concrete and the structural steel were being stick built at site. Okay. But the structural steel, which is the final piece, was, was industrialized in so far as that they prepared what they called flat packs on trailers, which likely aligned with a physical space or a physical 3D volume that was supposed to be put together at site. Okay. So that all these flat packs ready to go. And they literally had a massive lay down area full of these things. What was also going on was that the structural steel subcontractor had aggressively bid the work. Let's say they were, they bid it at X amount of hours per ton of steel. The productivity challenge that they were facing was that it was taking three X in terms of the man hours per ton of steel installed. So the subcontractor was facing significant productivity challenges was facing significant losses and was also causing significant schedule delay, okay? But the original intention was, we have these packages, we have these flat packs, it's going to be all smooth and dandy, okay? When we then looked at the complications that were happening at site, and I'll show you in pictures in a minute, but what we started to see was that negative variability at site was, was actually fully reversing the aspired productivity gains that they wanted to get from the flat packs. What were some of the dri uh, factors driving that variability? 
So there were dimensional control issues between civil and structural steel. So they chosen for bolted connections and the embedded plates in the concrete were not always aligned with where the bolt holes were in the structural steel. <clears throat> there was shifting execution choices. So the foreman and the people at site were choosing to erect differently than how the flat packs had been prepared. And there were tolerance issues, just alignment issues um, where the subcontractor wasn't able to meet the specs needed. Now, so those were the drives for negative variability. What we then also saw was that the design choices, in this case, the bolted connections, really reduced the ability to deal with dimensional control issues in the field, okay? So they had to either, you know, drill holes in the steel or they had to somehow uh, change the embedded plates. So the design choice, designed for constructability, as we'll later call it, right, had made, in this particular case, the negative variability worse, okay? And then the other complication that we had was that this low productivity was basically fully straining the relationship between the owner, the EPC, and the subcontractor. So the learnings that we took from that, when it comes to industrialization, right, is that if you want to capture the potential from this, then you have to understand deeply the potential sources of negative variability on site, right, and the unintended consequences. And what it also, uh, because if you understand where it can go wrong, you can understand how that will impact how many of these industrialized units you put in inventory because you're trying to do it in such a way that you protect your work at site, but at the same time also not overproduce because that will just a, only tie up cash, but B, could cause significant rework on stuff that you thought you'd fabricated already. Yeah? And several uh, capabilities from industrialization then also were clearly the value of that increases significantly in, in, in an industrialized construction world. Right? So obviously production planning and production scheduling that increased predictability. It was already important in the traditional stick build world in the industrialized construction world, you can't do without it. The second point that becomes extremely important, quality in station is, as I call it, it's, it's a term that was, that was coined by Toyota, but it's really ensuring that no defects are passed on, right? Because as soon as you pass on a defect, it messes up your work package that you thought was going to work and no longer does. And if you then have partial erection of a work pack, you can imagine what that does. And again, I'll illustrate in a minute. And the third thing is that design for construction. So really knowing like how your product design impacts your process and your execution, right? That also becomes a capability that's extremely valuable. And then lastly, in, in, in aerospace, that's called production engineering. I think in this case, uh, we're talking about the process design uh, as PPI represents it. And then lastly, you have the uh, load balancing between fabrication and insulation is critical. Again, it's the optimum between how much you have at site eh, to be able to have an alternative work from that the primary doesn't work, but at the same time, not too much that you risk the rework that I mentioned before. Anyway, that's the story in short. I was just going to illustrate this. So firstly, the project that we were looking at, right, gives you a bit of a sense of what it looks like, the stage it was in, right? So civil works had already been done and they were starting to do the structural steel around it, which uh, you can see here, okay? Now, and this project was order of magnitude, somewhere between one and 2 billion US dollar. The issues we observed, which is how we got to the learnings, was when, so as we said, we were brought in because there were productivity challenges being experienced by the subcontractor impacting the schedule. So we went in and we did some, 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 some field-based observations. What did we see? We saw, for example, significant double and triple handling of material. So the cranes, which were at the location of work, that were intended to be used to er erect steel or to lift steel into place were being used to conduct multiple picks to offload and reload pieces coming from the flat pack, 
And I have an image in the next page that shows you what we mean with the flat pack. What we were also seeing was that there was out of sequence work, right? So elements were unable to be finished because of the quality of work. So we had pieces of structural steel that were left hanging as a result of the embedded plates being in the wrong location. What we also observed was, for example, rents time losses. So there was a, a situation where the wrong piece of steel was picked, and it was probably because the inventory at the site was too much. And it took them 45 minutes to figure out that A, it was the wrong piece, and they had to replace and get the right one. The sole issue resolution was not so relevant for this uh, discussion, but anyway, this is one of these examples where the wheelchair wiper of a crane wasn't being used or it hadn't been repaired and in weeks, and, and the subcontractors who needed to manage this together hadn't aligned it. But that's a separate thing. But the other thing that was interesting was the lean mindset. So on this piece of steel that was the wrong one, after 45 minutes that they figured out and resolved it and the crane lifted the right piece into place, and we engaged the, the, the foreman to ask him what needed to be improved in this particular situation. And he said, we need faster cranes. Now, as you might imagine, that's not exactly what we would argue is the right solution. But it very much showed the traditional mindset of, you know, predominantly wanting to focus on additional capacity, so more crane capacity, faster crane capacity, but also the inventory, increasing the laydown area. Okay, so when we look at the root causes of these, some of these, and let me highlight the one on the next page. So the idea of industrialization was noble, right? We said if we prepare these flat packs and the flat packs arrive, right, you're you're, you're managing basically or ensuring that all the right pieces are there to construct the work as required. Yeah, but when we looked at these, at the composition, either the flat racks were optimized for the fabrication, for, for the fabrication workshops, right? Or for volumetric space, we couldn't completely discern which one it is. Either way, they ended up not being the required construction sequence. And then what does that practically end up happening? So on the left-hand side, you can see the flat pack. So it's a trailer, that a truck can simply lift and I don't know, all right? And then on the right-hand side, you can see it being offloaded. Now, what you'll see, I don't know whether, it, whether it's super clear, is that for a flat pack, you have the heavy parts on the bottom and the lighter parts on top. So if you're out of sequence and you need one of the heavy beams at the bottom, you need to unpack everything Put, get the heavy steel out of it, put the rest back, and then take it away again, okay? So that's where the productivity losses really accrue because this is the location of work. This is where your critical produ pro uh, production is happening and we want to have the highest productivity. The quality issues, I don't know whether this is completely clear, but you can see here, but on the, on the right-hand side of the picture, right, you can see that the embedded plate in the back was missing bolts. So these structural steel members were left hanging. So again, from the principle of industrialization, if you have this kind of quality, quality issues feeding through, it completely reverses the objective of what you're trying to achieve with industrialization, which is very smooth, very, very consistent flow of work. Yeah, and on the left-hand side also, you can see that these beams that are on the left-hand side, they're actually crooked. So it means that the two beams, this one and that one, are slightly out, also have tolerance issues, and you could see that you couldn't finish the rest of it, okay? So the quality issues are absolutely killing from when you're trying to do this industrialization. Then this is what the uh, total uh, inventory site looked like. Here you can see, again, the flat pack, and all the parts that they kept in place, right? Thinking that inventory would protect productivity, but which obviously enabled them to freely choose and shift execution choices, meaning that the next, next flat pack was even worse in terms of having the right pieces than the one before, okay? And then lastly, as I said before, right? These bolted connections, right? Really made the negative variability as in if there was dimensional control issues even worse because of all the reaper that rework that needed to happen and obviously it couldn't be done at the, at the location of work it had to be moved back and transported again so what we 
we just wanted to share in this brief story is that look, there's many benefits industrialization has great potential right so it, it it enables port standardization as we just discussed it enables production standardization as we just discussed but and i just discussed me in the previous presentations right it allows you to capture the learning curve if you do this in a more standardized way it allows inventory optimization product to be gained logistics optimization there's a whole bunch of things that come with these benefits but there's also a real need for certain capabilities, right? Which include production control, includes design for construction or production engineering, right? The quality and station, making sure that no defects should pass on. It, it goes into production system optimization, understanding what the optimal level of inventory is to connect fabrication with the site, acknowledging that there will always be a bit of variability Right, it requires data and analytics and, and inventory tracking and control. Those are the types of capabilities that in the industrialized world, as others have already talked to, will become materially more important. That's what I wanted to share, just lessons learned. So I hope that was interesting for the discussion. Thank you, Jan, for uh, sharing your experience and, and that story. It's, a, it's an incredible story that, again, I think repeats the learning that even if you actually have or trying to improve or making certain decisions without understanding the implications and the overall design could have a detrimental effect, which wipes out the original intent that you're trying to achieve. So I uh, really appreciate that experience. Okay. All right. So one of the things that we're going to go do is that you laid out what well, question was, the to about the tolerances. Now, the tolerances come from the product tolerances, right? However, there's other tolerances that we can actually talk about, which is temporal tolerances. When does things, that certain things are need to get to where? And when does certain things actually need to get done when? And that's not a typical construction management science, but as we talked about before, it is about the science of how do I make things? So, and that actually is the fundamental element. Let me actually see if I can go back and show my screen here. The fundamental element of industrialized construction. So again, taking manufacturing approaches and adopting it to construction. So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about moving away from science of a thing, how do we design things, and actually move into science of making, okay? To do that, what we're going to do is invite our experiment to give us a little bit of an overview on what operation science is. And let me introduce Mark. Mark joined Strategic Price Solutions in 2018 as a director of technical uh, solutions, as well as technical director of the Project Production Institute. He is the founder, president, and chief executive officer of Factory Physics Inc., a firm that is now part of SPS and provides management consulting training and software to improve manufacturing and supply chain management. Spearman co-authored the award-winning book, Factory Physics, The Foundations of Manufacturing Management, which has led a paradigm shift in the approach companies take, take in man managing their operations. So with that, I'm gonna actually hand it over to Mark. Mark, over to you. Okay. so. I've been listening to these talks. I'm very happy to hear about applications of operation science and how it's being applied. We've always thought it was a very general application, and it turns out that it is. So that's very gratifying. So operation science takes a different approach. We use a different ter terminology. We have different measurements instead of um, talking about Gantt charts and last responsible moment, integrated work packages and so on. We're gonna be talking about work in process, throughput, cycle time, utilization, fill rates, inventory, investment, all these kind of things. And it's not that the old project measures aren't important. It's just that there's other measures that are also important. So we have to make sure we do all of those, both of those. So I'll go back to Todd's slide. Traditional project management, you, you define the scope and quality, talk about the schedule, when does it need to be finished, and then you look at the resources that you need to do it. 
BPM looks at the product design, you know, can even maybe what the specs are of the of the deliverable in order to make it more useful for the ultimate customer and also make it easier to install, to build. And then we really focus on the process, the system that's going to deliver the project, the production system, as we've been talking about all day. And production systems involve capacity, inventory, and are affected by variability. And so that's kind of a big difference between the two approaches is we look at the production system to see whether or not it does have the capability to deliver this project at the time that it's needed to be delivered. And the way we do that is we first build a map, just a simple map of, of the process, looking at all the steps that are need to be done. And we convert that map into a model. The model could be an analytic model. Usually we start with an analytical model. And then we also can do a Monte Carlo discrete event simulation model. I'll talk a little bit more about both of those. Once we have a model, <clears throat> we can simulate the production system that will deliver the project. We can analyze it and make sure there's enough capacity, there's going to be enough work in process, not too much work in process, enough inventory, the lead times are going to be appropriate, and so on. And some things we can actually optimize. Two things that are really important to optimize are the inventory policies. When, when do we need things to be on site so that we will not delay the project, but not so early that, that we clutter the site? I mean, we've had things like a distillation column delivered two years before it was needed. And, you know, this is not good because probably the requirements for that column will change in those two years, not to mention the environment it was stored in isn't good for it. So we want things, we don't want things delivered just in time necessarily. We want them delivered so that there's low probability of not having it, very low probability. And, we, and we'll show that where a lot of companies have no probability of, of being late, but they have way too much inventory also. Once we optimize those parameters, we use those parameters to control the project. And so it feeds into the control systems, tells us when, the, when to bring on more WIP, when to release more jobs, when to order, all these, all these things. There's thousands of different parameters that have to be optimized. So you need to have a system that can do a lot at once. And while we're executing the project, we're looking for ways to improve. And, and when we we're doing that, we're collecting more data. So those improvement ideas and the data go back into the map of the model and improve it, make a better map, better model, a better model, continue to analyze and optimize and continue to control and improve. So it's an iterative cycle. So the focus in traditional project management is on milestones in time given by a Gantt chart. And the idea is that if you look like you're going to miss one of these milestones, you, you go and make some adjustments. You add capacity or reprioritize or, or do something. And then on the right-hand side here, we see things like, you know, how much work is done, how much work's been planned, uh, how much have we gotten paid, these kind of things people worry about. But they're not, these, these measures are important, but they're not looking at the production system. So the difference between the digital twin that runs the old way of doing this to the new way of doing this is the, the new way the focus isn't on milestones in time, but target rates, target production rates. And rates are directly related to capacity because the rate at which tasks are completed can never exceed the capacity of the project. The capacity of the project is the bottleneck of the project. And if you, but if you maintain the rates, you will hit the dates. So that's a very key uh, thing that we focus on. And rates are something that we look at every day. We don't uh, look at it when we start, you know, a rate falls. We look at it every day and make sure that we're maintaining the rate that we need to maintain. At the same time, <clears throat> we can do some very quick analysis. We call this absolute benchmarking. 
it basically takes four pieces of data, my current WIP, my current throughput. Throughput is basically how many tasks I need to do and how much time, divided by how much time. My current bottleneck rate and the raw process time, which is the time to go through the complete a task if there were no uh, queuing or interruptions like that. And we can plot this on, on this graph. And what we see at the very top, the current state, the green line is the throughput, blue line is the uh, cycle time. The top green line is the ideal. The, the dashed green line is what we call the practical worst case. Likewise, with the solid blue line is the ideal and the dashed line is practical worst case. In this case, you can see that the throughput's actually below the practical worst case and the cycle time is above the practical worst case. After performing the optimization, we move the throughput into what we call the lean zone, the good zone. It's above the practical worst case. It's never going to be at the ideal. But now what we've done is we've increased throughput from around three tasks per day to about four and a half tasks per day. And the cycle time has gone from about 25 days to about 15 days. So it's a huge improvement. This is a small uh, part of a project, but this flow was improved a, a great deal. And you can, you can see it very easily. On the graph. Very easy to do. That's a kind of a first cut. But after doing something like that, we'll want to have a more detailed project. And so this is a small piece of a very large project. You can see down in the lower right here, um, the rest of the, the project. And we also, by looking at this, we can see that there is a potential problem. All of these, these parts coming from different, some of these are different suppliers, some of these are some of our own fabrication. They all have to come together here before we can do this operation here. And we call that wait to match time. And the way to the only way to handle that is to make sure we have an inventory buffer here or essentially a lead time buffer. Lead time buffer is going to end up being an inventory buffer as well. So we want to max we want to make sure that that inventory buffer we have is big enough to accommodate all of these things coming together, but not so big that it, it, it exceeds the inventory requirements that we should uh, require. So the next slide shows some of the, the basic um, uh, equations that we use. And if you've attended these before, you've seen a lot of these. The first one is Little's Law. It says WIP is basically proportional to throughput. I mean, cycle time is basically proportional to WIP because the throughput is going to be the number of tasks divided by the duration that you're allowing. So that's fixed. So basically, whip and cycle time are two measures of the same thing. The only difference is you can see whip, you can't see cycle time. And also, whip is a leading indicator of cycle time. If whip goes up today, cycle time will go up next week or next month. And so controlling whip is very important. Trying to control cycle time is kind of futile. You end up with an uncontrollable system that, that oscillates terribly. The other important formula is the cycle time formula it says cycle time is raw process time plus batch time plus move time plus queue time plus shift differential time plus the wait to match time I mentioned plus the planned time buffer. The raw process time is the actual time you're doing something. The batch time includes wait to batch and waiting in a batch. So you may be accumulating a batch before you do the process and after that process everything's moved to the next workstation where it can't all be worked on at the same time. Move time can be long, but typically on a project, it may not be that long. The longest times are queue time and batch time. And typically those two added together, if you take out the planned time buffer, those two added together represent probably 90% of the actual cycle time, not including the wait to match time or the planned time buffer. The shift differential time comes about when you have different crafts working on different shifts, and so things are stationary. 
the wait to move time we talked about on the previous slide, the plan time buffer is usually a, a CYA that's put in there to make sure that we get things finished on time. And so we really don't want the plan time buffer in there if we don't need it. And so Mark, we, just, just actually add a point, I think is this is a pretty uh, actually deep conversation that a lot of people could benefit from, but not, not as because of the constraint in time. Again, I think it's a, it's a topic that Mark and I, we'd be actually happy to discuss with you in more detail if you're actually interested. But one of the things you might already be recognizing is we are speaking a different language and that is the language of manufacturing that Mark is introducing. Okay. Right. Thanks, James. So, yeah, anyway, so the food equation is also uh, the cycle time. So once we build the uh, model, we can use analytic models or we can use discrete event simulation and the analytic models we talked about before and the discrete event simulation shows like an actual picture of the whip as it goes through and you can run this for different random variables and see how much it changes each time notice that the utilization this these are the utilization of the resources they're basically the same this graph is a little easier to digest and looking at a, a noisy picture of, of the whip versus time the um the important thing is, uh, wait, uh, okay. And then here, here are some of the basic graphs. Here's what I was talking about with the inventory. So the, the x-axis is uh, the, the probability you have a given part in inventory. And then the total investment is on the inventory investment dollars is on the y-axis. And I believe these are in thousands. So this is, this is probably not, it's not just one part, maybe a thousand parts. Currently they're operating up here so about 80 million in inventory. And you can see that you could be down here with a more frequent uh, orders and a, a lower target and still be at 100% uh, fill rate. So that's a, that's a huge savings. Up here is discounted cash flow and shows the, the benefit of reducing cycle time to bring in the first, this is from a, a well development uh, field oil field development. So finally, there's the make versus buy decision that needs to be made, and we can analyze this as well. Some of the KPIs for, for making, you have a service level, which is what's the probability your lead time is long enough to get things done. If you're gonna make it, you're gonna to have to invest some money in, in, capital, in capital equipment, and then there's gonna be a, a cost labor and, and, and whatnot. And then you'll have cash tied up in, in WIP. If you buy, then you'll be looking at a fill rate for the inventory. You don't have so much investment, but you still will have a cost. You'll have a cost per part as you buy it. And there's also cash tied up in this inventory. So those are kind of the different uh, things you have to consider. And finally, Project management looks at labor productivity, float, cost variance, schedule variance, cost and schedule performance indices. And these are still important. Maybe some of the indices aren't so important, but we'll still be looking at all these, these basic measures, but we'll add to those service level and fill rate, whip, what we call critical whip versus how much whip position you have. The, uh, capacity utilization, the batch size turns out to be a huge thing, can really change the time it takes to finish the project by optimizing that. Inventory position includes not only what's on hand, but also what's on order, and those both need to be monitored and controlled with reorder points and reorder quantities. And these are the, some of the reorder points, reorder quantities, and batch size. Those are some of the things that, that we can optimize, and after we optimize it, goes into the system and then the system becomes more effective. So I'll stop there and we can take questions at the end. Okay, thank you, Mark. So I, I think what I think the point that, that uh, we're trying to convey is when we're now starting to adopt manufacturing techno techniques and approaches to construction, that it requires us actually rethinking about some of the, the methodologies and approach, but also the metrics 
and and the questions and answers that we are questions that we might be asking ourselves. So with that, what we're going to do is now quickly hand over to Roberto, who I don't think actually needs a, a, a introduction as he's been doing the session all day, but he as a, as a senior vice president of SPS technical services, he has had the opportunity to work with many organizations that are on this journey. And what he's going to do is provide some insights he's gathered from supporting those organizations. Roberto, over to you. Thank you, James. So we're going to bring to you some ideas of what we are seeing. You know, we call it here some field observations on organizations that are pursuing industrialized construction. And one of the questions that we should ask ourselves is, you know, industrialized construction is really pushing the project production systems and changing how they are configured, right? So the question is, are we making the right decisions about those configurations, right? And so let's think about that question as we go through, and I think you should think about that as well. Okay, so what do we see? James mentioned this earlier, and so I'm just bringing that same diagram to keep it think, uh, simple, that obviously industrialized becomes that intersection, that convergence of construction and manufacturing practices. However, what we see, if we start with the one on the right, is that there are a lot of construction companies that are moving to the left, meaning that they're actually trying to provide services uh, for their customers and jump on this movement of industrialized construction, right? We also see manufacturing companies that are not construction companies, just to be clear, are companies that are embedded in the making of parts, components that are moving to the right, right? And they're actually offering services to customers, owners, right? Different type of customers about how they're going to start assembling, fabricating, assembling, and delivering, not just a part, but a much more complex assembly or group of assemblies, or you could even call them modules, right? And so if we also look on the right, what <clears throat> the industry has been experiencing for, I would say many, many years, right? There's nothing new about that, is that for a given project, right? A construction company might make decisions about fabricating and assembling things off site, right? Or even fabricating and assembling things on site, right? In industrial construction, we see, we see a lot of, of that with pipe spools, for instance, right? People are fabricating pipe spools or cutting, bending pipe, welding pipe, and, and creating an assembly, right? And so this actual change in the industry is reconfiguring supply chains. And this is happening in front of us, in front of our eyes, right? And I think we need to be conscious that this is not only happening, but we need to be ready to determine, once again, what are the implications for us involved in, when I say us, I mean all the different parties in the engineering and construction industry. How do we engineer? How do we fabricate, assemble, deliver things? And how do we handle installation, right? And so I wanna bring a couple of examples to you in a minute, but what, what, is, what is important to, to emphasize is for those like are in construction, right? We talked earlier, Todd mentioned this on a heavy construction management perspective. A lot of companies we're seeing, they're bringing this conventional, let's use that word, uh, co uh, construction management perspective and trying to apply that in, a, in an off-site environment, a facility, fabrication assembly facility. That is not gonna work, right? A lot of them maintain a position to focus quite strongly on an administration approach versus a project production approach. Mark just took us through operation science and although that science has been applied and is being applied in manufacturing on the left side of that Venn diagram, it applies to any sort of production system, right? Including temporary production systems like projects, 
as, as the industry changes and, and, and moving this industrialized construction effort. And so let's take a look at a couple of examples. I'm conscious of time, I wanna to have to move extremely quickly on this. So what you see here are two representations of production systems, right? Happening in the same physical facility, in the same assembly facility. The blue line around each of these represent the physical boundaries of this assembly facility. What you see outside the blue dotted line are the different, let's call them supply flows of different components, different materials, different sub-assemblies that are needed for this entire production system to generate a throughput. The throughput might be a module going out of the production system to meet certain demand, right? And so what you see in this actual real life example is a production, two production systems physically in the same facility, right? The complexity of what is outside the facility, just visually, right? I'm not running any analysis, just visually, it's much larger than what happens inside the facility itself. And so what we see, once again, we're talking about field observations, is companies not really understanding the end-to-end -end production system that they are supposed to be managing and concentrated only on what they are directly responsible for. We believe that is a big mistake and the industry should be conscious about that because the complexity quite quite higher, as you can see here in other places. The question is, how much inventory are we going to allocate where? What are the lead times associated with all these different subcomponents of the production system outside the, the blue circle, the blue uh, area, okay? So the first step is, do we understand, do we understand the production systems that we are managing or are supposed to be managing, number one? Are we making the right decisions about how we handle the entire production system or even a component of it? Like this part here that I'm circling with my mouse that represents in this particular case, the steel structure that goes with the module that the entire production system generates. So one thing that Mark actually took us through, and I'm not gonna repeat it because he explained uh, uh, a little bit of this, but what you see here is actual true data from the previous production system that you saw, where the current state of, of how the production system behave with capacity utilization of 59, we estimated this, we calculated this using operation science, will give us a throughput that is about 3.2. And also we'll have a cycle time that is about 20, 20 23 days or so to deliver a, a portion of that, right? And what is important to highlight here is that capacity and resources are not the same. Using the same amount of resources, we can increase the capacity utilization of the production system to a much higher value, 85%. We are not saying 100% because as Mark and even Todd earlier, introduce the, the closer we get to 100%, the longer the cycle time, right? That's not good. So we wanna keep, we wanna maintain that capacity utilization of the entire production system to a value around the one you see here, 85. By doing that without increasing resources, this is very important, we can significantly increase throughput and we can reduce cycle time, which is also important in order to be meeting service levels and address the demand. But if we take a much higher level view, the, the, the perspective about the difference between lead time and cycle time, in this example, the, the, the one that was showing earlier, we have a lead time for a given module of about 40 or so weeks, right? 40 weeks, you are talking about 10 months, right? Let's do the math, right? And that includes being the, the need to assemble a frame for a, a steel frame and then integrate and then deliver, right? But, and all this is the, the high level different flows that need to be 
They need to be managed by this organization. One of them, our electrical gear, is being supplied by their customer, but the other ones are elements of their production system that they need to uh, manage directly. This is a subset of just the steel production system, right? Where you have, you know, going all the way back to the mill components, shipping to the fabricator, different organizations involved. And this is a true story. Look at how many different parties are involved and the lead time that it takes in order for the company that is fabricating and assembling those modules to get the steel frames need to be painted, assembled, blasted, and then shipped to the assembly facility, right? We are, as an industry, misunderstanding or not fully understanding the complexity and what decision we're making when we say we're gonna go industrialize. How do we handle this, right? We cannot control the execution of work with placing POs, right? This is not a commercial problem, right? How can we decouple the commercial from the operations, right? This is another example that I finished with this, uh, otherwise James is gonna get upset, of a manufacturing company that was moving on that Venn diagram from the left to the right or to the middle, right? And this company was tasked by a customer to fabricate a specific type of modules, right? But with an increase in demand from four modules to eight modules, and these modules are not exactly identically physically the same, right? The question is, is the production system able to meet demand and all, all the time, right? This is something that we were able to understand what is that production system, what, how it's configured, and this company made a decision to decouple the modules, physically decouple the modules into subcomponents and give some of those components to a third party manufacturing company. What the owner might have not realized in this particular case, that someone on site is gonna end up with the job of assembling the module with different components. And because different components, these different components are not identical, they need to arrive in a specific sequence. So although we're making a decision to fabricate off-site and modularize, and even we can actually talk about productization, not having an entire perspective of the production system might move the industry and the players in the wrong direction. Because for the guys doing the installation on site, we can see here, this is gonna be a nightmare and all the benefits of fabricating off site might be lost by just dealing with this integration, physical integration in the field, okay? So we'll leave you with the same question. Are we making the right decisions about how we configure project production systems, right? There's a lot of things to learn about the confluence, the congruence of convergence of production systems and the idea of industrialized construction. Over to you, James. Thank you, Roberto. So Roberto is giving a, a very interesting example of what he's seeing out there. And if you actually start to look at the boundaries of what he created as the factory, the question is, everything else that they're now looking at is what they buy. So one of the opportunities to figure out what is that boundary look like for your factory if you're going into the industrialized construction. Now at the starting of this session, we actually talked about the uh, typical approach that people are taking to get to industrialized construction. And the question that we paused was, is there a faster roadmap? Okay, is there a faster roadmap? And I think, what the Autodesk has talked about, what the BP Keith has talked about, it gives you a little bit of hint in maybe how to accelerate this process. But we propose that rather than taking a sequential approach to focus on product and process, and then working on the production system, we propose that there is a concurrent design opportunity here. So as Todd talked about this morning, there's no free moves. So if you're going to change something that has implications, something else, so why rather than doing it sequentially, how do we do this? Uh, why don't we actually do this concurrently? And when we're doing concurrently, the question becomes, so how, what does the actual roadmap look like in this new model? And this is what we're proposing. Okay. 
we did not as an in, in, as a as a humanity as a society we did not wait until we had mapped the new business processes we did had educated everyone and they have changed all the business processes before we started adopting mobile phones into our daily lives and business lives we leveraged technology to shape how the new future might look like and i think this is exactly the opportunity that we have for construction so as we're moving into industrialized construction, as BP talked about, as Amy talked about, as the one of the foundational elements, I think we'll call it process, is to understand the capability of your supply network through the production system design, optimization, and control. Make that, light that up, talk using the IoT, because there is already movement going on in your supply network through the industrial 4.0, and supply chain 4.0. Some of this concept, I think Todd and his group will talk about in the next session. And then based on the capacity and the capability of your supply network, start actually thinking about what is going, what we should we actually standardize and productize in order to leverage or increase the, increase the capacity of your production system if it needs to be. At which point you're now starting to realize industrialized construction. And then by adding all the AI, ML, as well as the real-time feedback and feed forward, you're now starting to create intelligent production. So rather than relying on a, a conventional tools and methodology to transform the industry, what we're saying is leverage technology that's already out there and the approaches that the other, other industries already have benefited from and leverage that to fasten our journey through the, the change. Okay. Again, that's uh, to get you started, the, the first step, there are a few things that we're gonna offer. One is the free tool that's actually by, provided by PPI. Again, as I said, free tool, just go to the resources and tools and process mapper on the PPI website to start gaining understanding as to what your process looks like, because as Mark pose, proposed, mapping is your first step. And then if you wanna learn a little bit more about how do I do this right? There is a certificate course that's being offered by in jointly with Cal Poly on these three tracks. Again, you can find out more details at the PPI website. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over back to Roberto. Sorry, we don't have additional time for questions, but we do have some questions and I will share it with, the, with our speakers that, and we'll get back to the people that have asked the questions. Thank you.